I want to welcome everyone tonight to uh, the uh, STEM lecture series. And uh, I just want to mention we have a couple of uh, couple of more programs throughout the semester coming up. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, I'm Don Barry. I'm a professor of geology here at Mesa College, and I help coordinate the STEM lecture series. It gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Chip Lancaster, who is a longtime uh, mathematics instructor here at Mesa College. Chip uh, just told me he's been teaching here at Mesa College for 32 years and he's been a pilot, a helicopter pilot, for over 50 years. So please give a warm welcome to Chip Lancaster. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to give you a little bit more of my background. So tonight we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna tell you how helicopters are fly and are controlled. So that's a, uh, sort of an amazement to a lot of people. But I, was, I have a degree in aeronautical engineering from the Naval Academy and from the Naval Postgraduate School. So I was in the Navy for 24 years. 20 of those were flying helicopters. So I, threw, I flew three different models of helicopters. Uh, uh, and if I threw out your names, it would just be confusing. So I won't even tell you that. Um, I also work as a, a ground school and pilot flight simulator instructor at North Island for a contractor there, teaching pilots and uh, air crew how not to crash their helicopter, which I'm sure everybody in the San Diego area uh, should, uh, should be glad about. And I also am a pilot and docent for a helicopter museum. One of only five helicopter museums in the entire world is right here in your backyard. So that's Classic Rotors Museum up at Ramona. And I can talk more about that later on. So I did bring some props. So right away, right now I'm wearing my flight jacket. Yay, so this is one of the ones I had in the Navy. So it's a Chip Lancaster Lieutenant USN right there. But I'm gonna take it off, because it is rather warm and sort of uh, confining when I work on the board. So I'll take it off. I also brought a uh, flight helmet. So one of the things that we're real conscious of uh, flying helicopters is safety. So safety is a big thing that we're concerned with. So uh, all of the professional pilots that you see are fighting fires or anything like that will be wearing a flight helmet. So this is a, a helicopter flight helmet right here, whoops, which is falling apart. Actually, it needs some repair. <laughs> this is one of the ones we use in the flight simulator. But it's rigged for uh, night vision goggles and everything. So it's, uh, but you can come up and check it out later on and see how light it is. So it's very light, put it right there. And then we got a number of blades. So this is a really large blade here. This is, I couldn't bring a whole helicopter or one of the, the main rotor blades in because they're just too big or too heavy. But this is, uh, this is a tail rotor blade off a 10,000 pound helicopter from 1950. And it's, it's like brand new, it's never actually been used. So it's one of the ones that we have in our helicopter museum at uh, Ramona. So that's off a 10,000 pound helicopter. Jesus. Then this is a, a smaller one off a, a, a 2,000 pound helicopter right here. So these are tail rotor blades and we'll talk about those as we go along. But I brought them in so you can see what they look like and you can see the aerodynamic cross section on, uh, on a blade. So the same cross section is on the main rotor blades which are much larger. And then I brought a whole uh, tail rotor drive section right here off a small uh, about a 2,000 pound helicopter so you can see how it's rigged up. So this is just the tail rotor and I'll talk more about this rigging as we go along. This is actually heavier because it has the, uh, the gearbox on it and all the drive mechanism. Okay, so those are my props right there. So a little bit of, of helicopter history. Now, uh, wings work with a, a pressure distribution across the wing. And I'll, I'll show you how that works here as we go along. But that pressure dis, uh, distribution mechanism has been known for over 6,000 years. So I Googled it, and the earliest sailboat was 6,000 years ago that's recorded. And that sailboat uses the same pressure distribution uh, technology, if you will, that's on a wing that uh, flies an airplane. And those are also on... Um, on windmills, for example, the windmills that we have up in uh, up there on the on the Laguna Ridge line, all those windmills are blades that are working with that pressure distribution and the winds turning them. 
Um, the earliest windmill in Holland that I could get, well, uh, the earliest windmill uh, that was used for grinding, uh, uh, grinding grain was about 1100, the, the year 1100. And so those windmills, the, you see a, a windmill in Holland or any place else, they're using the same uh, pressure distribution uh, technology that uh, the, rotor, the rotors use when they lift a helicopter up into the air or that the airliner uses when it takes off at Lindbergh Field and uh, flies to New Jersey or whatever it is. So it's the same pressure distribution phenomenon. Uh, so uh, people um, started to realize this more techno technologically during the 1800s. So man had been, uh, been enthralled with getting into the air, just humankind in general, enthralled with getting into the air uh, since before Leonardo da Vinci. And Leonardo da Vinci actually came up with some, uh, some drawing mechanisms, uh, one of which uh, was the, uh, the helical helix that, um, that he uh, designed to uh, pick somebody up into the air, but he never built it. But it wasn't until like the 1800s when the, when the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the aerodynamic uh, phenomena that was causing this was really understood. So sailboats have used them forever. So anytime you see a sailboat that's out there sailing on San Diego County, or you see one in the movies for a pirate ship, they're using the same aerodynamic tech that, uh, that wings use that uh, fly airplanes and uh, rotor blades use that fly helicopters. It's the same thing. So not until uh, the end of the 18th, uh, the end of the 19th century, in the late 1800s, uh, they were really sort of nailing it down, and they had actually built some glider mechanisms, some glider aircraft that flew. But the first powered flight, at least in the United States, was the Wright brothers in 1903, and they actually did uh, did studies on it, building their own uh, wind tunnel and uh, doing studies. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that the, heli the, the Wright brothers really wanted to make a helicopter. They didn't want to make something. They wanted to make something that they could pick up in front of their bicycle shop in Ohio and just fly around the area and sightsee and whatever. They didn't want to have to go a thousand miles to North Carolina to get enough wind to get up into the air. The problem was uh, uh, with making a helicopter was power was a getting, an, a getting an engine that was powerful enough to lift a helicopter up into the air. And so the Wright brothers had to build their own engine. They built it right there in their bicycle shop, a 12 horsepower engine, which was enough to get their uh, fixed wing airplane up into the air. A uh, helicopter, you'll see, takes a lot more power. The uh, Igor Sikorsky was one of our uh, primary helicopter pioneers in the United States. So Sikorsky was, um, he grew up in Kiev, uh, Ukraine. He was Ukrainian. He went to the, uh, to the Russian Naval Academy, and he taught math when he came to the United States. So I sort of feel a, a remote kinship with Igor because I've done all those things. I didn't grow up in Kiev, but I did go to the Naval Academy. I did teach math, and I do fly helicopters. So I feel that kinship with him. But Igor in, uh, in, in Kiev, when he was only 19 and 20 years old, built two helicopters in 1909 and 1910. The problem was the most powerful engine he could get was 24, 25 horsepower, which just wasn't enough to get his 450 pound uh, aircraft up into the air. And even if he did get it up into the air, he didn't know what he would do with it because he hadn't investigated control mechanisms at that time. So he went into to building fixed wing aircraft. He had a very, very, um, uh, uh, illustrious um, uh, uh, career building fixed wing aircraft, many of which flew way up into the uh, into the late mid and late 1960s. But anyway, let's go back. So we consider, at, sort of at our helicopter museum, we consider ourselves the uh, the treasury of helicopter uh, history and technology. So we like to maintain that history. And we consider the, the uh, 1930s. So from 1925 to about 1935 was really when people started to really uh, build an aircraft that would get off the ground. The problem was they couldn't control it. So I'll show you some of their uh, original uh, aircraft right here. We'll keep our fingers crossed there, Don. Oh, there you go. 
Yep. Okay. And go full screen. Maximize. Okay, there we go. Okay. So these are rather humorous uh, vehicles, but people put a lot of time and energy and expense into these. It does hang up on this one right here. So hang on just a second. We'll just skip on ahead a little ways. There we go. Okay, so they put a lot of time and energy and expense. That's Igor Sikorsky right there with his first helicopter. That was in uh, 1910. So right there, he's 20 years old. And then these are just some early uh, aircraft that they made in, that, uh, in the 20s and 30s, uh, many of which actually got off the ground. So that's an Italian one right there. It did get airborne. And they could go maybe 100 yards or maybe even a half a mile, but then they would have to land, and they couldn't do anything with them. So basically, the helicopters were pretty much uh, lucky if they could lift up themselves and one person. Some of them, you can see, were quite humorous, trying to get an aircraft up into the air. I like that one. I like the rotating one right there. That's called the Gray Goose, believe it or not. And they were, try they were rotating wings around like this that, with the idea, I guess, to get up into the air. But it didn't work. I mean, it was, uh, you can see it drew quite a crowd. Let's go up to the airport oh, and see what they're doing today. <laughs> yeah. And here's another one right here. Now, this one actually uh, <laughs> realized a problem called gyroscopic precession. <laughs> this one they're just bouncing up and down trying to get it airborne right there. That's kind of humorous. <laughs> I think all he did was give himself a flat tire. Now here he linked up with a, a, a light an, um, a balloon, so a, a helium filled balloon. But you can see one of the problems they're having is control. I don't know exactly what <laughs> this one was trying to do. But anyway. You know, we chuckle about it now, but back then it, it was a pretty serious endeavor. Now this is, uh, uh, I believe it's the Bozak, and he actually built a quadcopter that got up into the air. Again, control was an issue. He couldn't control it, so it just sort of wandered around. But a, quad, a quadcopter mechanism is one of the things that UAVs live now, use now, remotely uh, remotely piloted vehicles that people can go out and you can buy one in a hobby store and fly it. There it is again. This one is kind of a, an interesting endeavor. So what they did on this one, they had a regular uh, biplane that they put two propellers <coughs> on the upper wing to try and get it up into the air. This is an interesting one right here. So this is a, um, a coaxial helicopter biplane. So the, blade, the blades are biplane wings. And he actually got up into the air and flew a, a bit of a distance. Again, the, uh, the main issue was control. They're just not able to control it even if they can get up off the ground. Here's another one. This is a, a French uh, helicopter right here. It's a coaxial helicopter. Again, they got airborne and they actually flew for quite a distance until the um, until the rotors contacted one another and the aircraft crashed. Anyway. That's enough of those funny flying ones. I think we can stop that one. Oh, it's about to stop now. It did stop. Okay, good. So, it wasn't until uh, 1936 in Germany that the first truly successful helicopter was built. And that was a Fackelwolf FW61. So made by the Fackelwolf company in Germany. And they used a side-by-side -side rotor system. And they were the first ones not only to get up into the air, but actually to have complete control over the aircraft. So this is being flown by a, a female test pilot 
named uh, Hannah Reich. And you can see that there's two rotors side by side. It's built around an, a regular airplane uh, fuselage, which wasn't uncommon in those days. It has a single propeller up in the front, basically for cooling air for the engine. So it uses one radial engine to power both rotors. And they actually demonstrated this in, um, that's Anna Reich right there, inside a stadium. This is them flying inside the stadium right here. It's flying inside an enclosed stadium in uh, Berlin. And it actually used up so much oxygen that the, the engine wouldn't work. And they had to open the doors and get more air in there. But anyway, that helicopter, that was 1936. And many, including Igor Sikorsky, many of the, the, uh, the aviation uh, entrepreneurs, um, and designers, including Igor Sikorsky, went to Russia, to, uh, excuse me, to Germany to see that helicopter. And they were so impressed, they went back and put a lot of their own ideas into effect until uh, Sikorsky finally got enough funding through United Aircraft to finally design and build his first helicopter. So he's the first one, successful one, in the United States. Well, this one has sound. Can we turn that up? Oh, it's up all the way. Oh, well. But he flew his first one in 1939. Okay? And that was the first successful one flown in the United States. Okay, that's what just, it was just a short one. I'll close that out. So most people don't realize that uh, both the, uh, the Germans certainly used uh, helicopters throughout World War II. And the United States also did in 42, 43, 44, and 45. So most of World War II, the United States had a helicopter built by, uh, it was built by the Sikorsky Helicopter Company at the time. There was only one successful one that had flown at that time. By the end of the 1940s, there was many other successful ones that had been flown. And you can see some of those at our museum in Ramona. But first, what I want to do now is talk about, get back into why helicopter or how helicopters fly. Okay, so we can, we can raise this, uh, Don, because I want to use the board and turn the lights on again. Is that okay with you if we raise this? It'll be okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay with you. Good. <laughs> All right, we'll raise that. Um, so anyway, aerodynamics. I know. <laughs> so again, I sort of want to explain a little bit about how that uh, the pressure phenomenon works. If I can uh, raise the uh, the screen here, modern technology. We can build a helicopter. Yeah, we can build a helicopter, but we can't get the screen. Up. Ah, there we go. Yay, okay. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Ah, I'm going to move my blade out of the way here. here. You come up later and pick that up and see how heavy it is. Okay, so the way an airfoil works, so this is how wings get up into the air. Okay, so we have a basic airfoil that looks something like that, and it'll have the wind coming in like this, okay? And there's a cord line right there, and it will make an angle of attack with the wind, alpha. But what that does is the air splits right here, and it goes over the top of the wind here, and across the bottom of the wind here. Okay, this is, uh, basically this is fast air, this is slower air. This is the KISS principle of why <laughs> why these things work. And what it does is it makes a um, color, like lots of color. Okay, so it makes a, uh, a resultant uh, vector right there that's split into two parts. This vector right here, which is called lift. And boom, 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 boom. Another one around here, which is called drag. Okay? 
But that's how it works, and the sailboat works the same way. So it just makes that pressure differential. So it's higher on one side, lower on the on the other on the bottom side, and or excuse me, higher on the bottom side, lower on the top side, and then picks up up in the up into the air. Yeah. So that's Bernoulli principle 101. Okay. <laughs> but um, okay. So, helicopter. So let's talk about the control mechanisms, and then we'll talk about how it works. So in the cockpit, I got three controls. So I got the cycling stick, which is right here between my legs. Okay, boom, boom, boom. And that way I can tilt the uh, rotor disc to one side or the other, forward or back, left or right. And then I got another stick over here called the collective stick over in this hand here. I couldn't get my hands on any control sticks. We didn't have any loose ones. But that collective strip, I put, I bring it up and down like that, and it lifts the helicopter up into the air uh, collectively. And I'll tell you about that here in a minute. And then down on my feet, I got two rudder pedals down here. So they're called rudder pedals, just like on a boat. And by pushing the rudder pedals, I can yaw the nose like this. So I got uh, uh, three sets of controls. So all of, my, all of my appendages are working all of the time when the helicopter is up in the air. Sometimes some helicopters have uh, automatic flight control systems where I can let go of an appendage or two and it'll keep things uh, working right. But uh, most of the older ones don't that I fly now. Okay, so that's basically the cockpit controls. So let's talk about the head controls. So up on the rotor head, I have what are called swash plates. So I have a stationary one, and then on top of that, I got a rotating one. Okay, and these are called swash plates. That's going to be on the test. <laughs> swash plates, Mr. L. Swash plates, right there. Got it. Okay, swash plates. Okay, good. And then coming up through the swash plates is the rotor mass going up like this. And at the top of the rotor mast, then I have my blades hooked up like this. But then going from the stationary swash plate doesn't move. In fact, it has uh, servos linked up to it that are uh, getting controlled from the cockpit. So these can go up and down like that and move the stationary swash plate. They can like tilt it in different directions. And then the rotating one is sitting on top and it has um, it has uh, pitch change links mm -hmm. that are going over like this. To change the angle of attack on the blades. Okay, so you can see, on, even on a tail rotor blade here, I have the pitch change links. So here's the, uh, uh, we have, uh, on this one, I got a stationary swash plate here. This is a little bit different. And then I got a rotating one on top of it, but you can see the pitch change lengths right there. See them? And they're going up to the blades. So they change the angle of attack of the tail rotor. Okay, so what else do we got here? So the, uh, the rotors typically up on top are turning in this direction like this, and this is turning in the same direction like that. Okay, and that's hooked up to a transmission. And then that's hooked up to engines right here. So engine to transmission up to the uh, rotor blades. And the, the, one, the bottom swash plate doesn't move, the top one does. So that's how, in a, a typical helicopter, some helicopters use slightly different mechanisms. But in general, a single tail rotor configured helicopter, that's the mechanism that it's going to use. So you see one flying around today, it's using that sort of mechanism to control the blades up on top. Okay, so the, my flight controls here go through here. Usually there's hydraulic servos here because the dynamic components can be rather difficult to move. There's a lot of uh, dynamic control force up on the head from the aerodynamic uh, uh, forces involved. Okay, I'm getting feedback. Is that okay? All right, so let's talk about the, how the helicopter is controlled aerodynamically then. 
So a fixed wing airplane, so we call them fixed wing because the wings don't move and they just go straight ahead, lifts up in the air. In a helicopter, the wing rotates. So it's always rotating around like this in a counterclockwise direction, uh, at least in uh, US and uh, uh, British and uh, German helicopters, French and Russian turn in the opposite direction, but it doesn't make any difference. So it turns like this, so the wing is always being turned in flight by the, uh, by the engine and transmission system. So when I pick it up into a hover, I use uh, the collective right here. And I just increase collective, I keep this stick in the middle, and what it does is it collectively changes the pitch of the blades. Okay, so let me draw another helicopter right here. So let's see, here's my little helicopter. I'll put it over here, let's see this one. And that's the rotors. The rotors actually go up at an angle like that. We call it a coning angle. But they, and, and if it's just sitting on the ground, they'll be flat. But once it starts developing lift, the lift will actually pick up the blades. The blades are mechanically attached to the rest of the helicopter, and they pick the whole helicopter up. Okay? So then it has an overall thrust vector here. Okay, when it's being picked up. This one has skids on it. So a lot of the smaller helicopters, you see a Robinson flying around. They're all skid equipped. They don't have wheels. Because uh, wheels is just another thing you gotta worry about. Getting a flat tire or uh, hurting your wheel or something like that. But if I just put two pipes down there and have them hooked to the bottom of the fuselage, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Those are called skids. Okay, so, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. so there's my little helicopter. So the collective moves things collectively. So the angle of attack is the same on all the blades as it goes around like this, okay? Uh, and that just lifts everything up the same amount. But I wanna move forward. So what I do is I move forward, and what it does, if you were looking at the helicopter from the outside like this, what you would see is this would tilt up like this. This would tilt down like that. And what it's doing is it's changing the thrust vector over like this, which gives you a forward movement vector like that to move the helicopter forward. So a lot of people get this confused with gyros gyroscopic precession. Uh, gyroscopic precession is when I rotate an object, it tends to want to turn like that. Um, you can tow it with a bicycle wheel or something like that. In helicopters, there are gyroscopic moments, but they're very small. They're really small and uh, pretty much negligible as far as the control of the helicopter goes, and that's because the blades are hinged. In other words, the blades flap. So the blades move up and down like this. There's a hinging moment right here, so they can move up and down like this. They can move back and forward like this and then they can uh, change an angle of tack, like that. So the blades have all those degrees of movement that they can do. So because they can flap like this along the hinge, there's no a gyroscopic moment that can be uh, sent across, except for a very, very, uh, uh, pretty much uh, insignificant one as far as uh, controlling the helicopter goes. Uh, so what happens? How do I get this thing tilted forward like that? So when I move it forward like this, it puts a control mechanism. If I look at a two-bladed system, so one blade here, one blade here. The blade here decreases an angle of attack. So it actually flies down like this. It's flying down. This blade increases an angle of attack, so it's flying up like this. So it's flying up like that. So the overall uh, picture that you would see if you were looking at it from the outside, you would see this rotor disc actually tilt forward. And that's why it's tilting forward. It doesn't have anything to do with gyroscopic moments, but it's just how the controls are inputted to the rotor blades. And that's called cyclic control. So this in the middle is my cyclic. This is my collective. So it moves the blades collectively, all the same amount at the same time. 
This is the cyclic control, and it moves the blades cyclically. So they're different. They, can, they change continuously as it goes around the swash plate like that. So the blade will dive down like this, and then it gets down here. This blade, in the fact, has climbed up like this, so it's up like that. And so now it's tilted forward. See that? Tilted forward. And then it can move out like that. And the same thing happens if I want to go left or right or backwards. I can just use the same mechanism, the cyclic control mechanism, to tilt the rotor system in that direction. When you're in the cockpit flying, you don't think at, uh, at all about that. I just know this makes me go up and this uh, makes me go in different directions. And then I got yaw control in the front. So the yaw control just yaws the nose like that, but it's very important. Okay, so that's how we get the aircraft up into the air and move it in different directions. So one of the problems that we have with a helicopter is called torque, T-O-R-Q-U-E. Very important work. This will be on the test also. Torque. I'm sort of saying that tongue in cheek because we're giving a math test tomorrow to my class. It won't be on that math test. Okay. I'm just saying that tongue in cheek. All right. So when a helicopter, if I look at it from the top, okay, so I'll put my helicopter from the top right here. Here it is. There's a tailbone going out like that. And the rotor blades, I'll put a blade up here and a blade down here. There's the center, they're hooked up right there. So the blade is going like this and like this, okay? Well, what happens, because it does that, the rest of the helicopter down here wants to go in the opposite direction. So the blades go this way, the rest of the helicopter wants to go that way. And that's one of the things that really, really um, held back engineers from developing a successful helicopter, is how do I take care of that torque effect? So the way that uh, Sikorsky finally ended up was he put a small tail rotor right here that makes an anti-torque force like this to counteract that moment. So then it keeps the uh, aircraft straight ahead. So when I pick it up, like when I pick it up like this, I know the nose is going to want to right, yaw right, so I have to put in a left rudder. So in helicopters, pilots just do that instinctively. So when I pick it up, I automatically put that in, and I'm just keeping the nose straight. Um, if you have an automatic flight control system, like many helicopters, like the uh, Seahawks that you see flying around today for the Navy, they have an automatic flight control system where those, uh, a lot of those linkages are linked up. So they have what's called control mixing. So when I pick up the collective, it automatically puts in a uh, anti-torque movement to counter the torque. Uh, but uh, pilots just instinctively do that. Anyway, so that's, that's the whole torque affair when I pick it up into the, uh, when I pick it up. Okay. So the other thing that I want though is I need yaw control. So the tail rotor gives my anti-torque, but I also need to yaw. So if I helicopter sitting in a hover, I want to point over in that direction, then I push in uh, uh, right pedal and it takes me over that way and now I'm facing that way also. But at the same time, it's doing anti-torque. But it also gives me yaw control. So I can yaw my nose in different directions. And I use that in correct coordination with a turn, just like a fixed wing airplane uses rudder in connection with a turn. So when they roll into a turn, they change their aileron control, it moves the wings down like this, it turns, but they also have to use rudder control to keep the airplane in balanced flight as it goes around like that. Helicopters have to do the same thing. So it has to, it ha we have to use that rudder to stay in balanced flight as I go, as I go around the turn. Um, let's see. So a couple of other problems with helicopters. I mentioned power. So the normal power to weight ratio for a helicopter is about 10 to 1. So that means if I have, say, a 200 horsepower engine, which wouldn't be uncommon in a small uh, civilian helicopter that you see flying around. They might have a 2 to 300 horsepower engine. Then they're limited to about two to 3,000 pounds. That's it. That's all they can pick up. And so designers actually have to design to less than that so, they can, so that we'll, they will have extra power to take people, fuel, cargo, whatever they need to do. And for maneuvering the helicopter too. So 
you see a big helicopter like, um, say, the H-53s. You see them uh, flying around right here. Uh, uh, they're flying out of Miramar. So that's the great big Marine Corps helicopter. It has three engines. Um, it develops about uh, 7,000, almost 8,000 horsepower with those three engines. So then it's limited to about 70,000 pounds. And as it, as it is, it's, uh, it's uh, going to only uh, limit its uh, weight load that it picks up to about 25,000 pounds. Okay? Uh, just to give you some perspective on that, um, someone could Google this. How much does a semi-truck weigh? <laughs> so a semi-truck that you see out on the road right there. Okay, it's going to be way in that category. I know, she's looking it up right now. <laughs> Very good. We'll get an answer here in a minute, but I'll keep talking. Uh, so anyway, that's one of the problems is power. And in the early days, that was one of, their, one of the uh, things that they couldn't get around. They had to get the most power out of the least amount of weight. And typically what that was, was what's called a radial engine. An engine that has the, all of the cylinders go around in like that. They're all in a big circle and they're air cooled. So there's no liquid cooling system. So that reduces the amount of weight of the engine. So for example, a radial engine uh, that we have in one of our flying helicopters at the museum uh, puts out 1,300 horsepower, but it also weighs 1,500 pounds and it's quite massive. It would be like this big around. Okay, and it has nine cylinders in a big circle like that. What was it? 35,000? Okay, good. Thank you very much. So 35,000 pounds. So what's that? That's 17.5 tons. So that Sikorsky that's flying around at, say, 40,000 pounds gross weight is at 20 tons. So it's equivalent to uh, a tractor-trailer truck out on the road into, into what it can, how much it weighs and what it can carry. Um, I lost my train of thought when you said that. Anyway, uh, power. Okay, so that was one. Uh, so... Uh, so in the, in the late 1950s, uh, jet engine technology, which was developed in the 30s and 40s, and took a tremendous boost uh, during World War II. So by the time the late 40s rolled around and into the 50s, they had the technology to build compact jet engines. So a compact jet engine that's about, uh, just a, uh, about as long as this table right here, and about that big and round. Okay, replace that great big radial engine that weighed 15, almost 1,500 pounds, and it develops 1,500 horsepower and only weighs 300 pounds. So when gas turbine engines came on, they were a big boon to the helicopter industry. The engineers, they just went crazy. Because now look what, can I, what I can do. I can have two of these for less than one of those and end up with more than twice the horsepower and only a fraction of the weight. And so they could, it was a tremendous boon to the helicopter industry. So that's engine power. Another one is torque, which we talked about there. Some helicopters, if you see one flying with rotors on both ends like this, that's called tandem rotor, and they just turn in the opposite direction, and that cancels the torque effect. Another one that you might see flying around is called the K-Max. So the K-Max uses an intermeshing rotor system like this. Again, they turn in opposite directions, cancel the torque effect. Uh, cancel the torque effect. The V-22 Osprey is a compound is a compound aircraft. It's not a true helicopter, but it can hover. And it uses two blades that turn in opposite directions, again, that cancel the torque effect. So sometimes, by the design mechanism, the torque problem is taken care of. The last one that I'll talk about is speed. So helicopters are inherently slow compared to fixed-wing airplanes. So a, a jet fighter, you know, might go Mach 2 or something like that. It can go like a thousand miles an hour. But a helicopter is limited. Typically, maximum speed on a helicopter is limited to about uh, less than 200 miles an hour. We, we measure speed in knots, nautical miles an hour. So it's about 180 knots, which is approaching 200 miles an hour. And the problem is uh, what we call uh, a, a retreating blade stall. So as I go forward in flight, this, uh, this wind vector right here is compounded with the, uh, with the speed of the helicopter. So this advancing blade on this side, we call this the advancing blade, this is the retreating blade. So on the advancing blade, it's seeing a higher relative wind. 
So it can make less of an angle of attack to produce an amount of lift which matches with the blade on the other side. The blade on the other side is seeing less wind and so it has to have a higher angle of attack to produce the same amount of lift to balance the, the lift distribution out uh, across uh, the rotor disc system. But what happens is on any wing, if I increase the angle of attack to a certain point, the wing's going to stall. So this is one of the things, anybody, anybody a fixed wing pilot in here? Anybody fly fixed wing? Like light aircraft? Okay. So that's one of the things that terrifies new flight students. So I was also a flight <coughs> instructor, is getting them to stall the airplane. Because <laughs> they think it's going to fall out of the sky and they're going to die. But what happens <laughs> is all of a sudden the, the lift just stops like this and the nose just drops like that and it, you increase speed and you can pick your lift back up again. Well, that's what happens on the retreating blade here because the angle of attack is increasing, increasing, increasing until it hits that stall point. And the helicopter luckily doesn't fall out of the sky. But what happens is you get really pronounced uh, vibration, an increase in vibrations. And you go, oh, that's not good. And so you slow the helicopter down until the vibrations go away, and now you're good again. But you know your maximum speed limit, so you aren't going to go any faster than that. So one of the things they're doing with uh, modern helicopters, um, you might see these, uh, Sikorsky is doing this. And um, he's making a, um, running out of space right here, over here, okay. So uh, a blade, uh, a helicopter, here's my helicopter like this. In the back, it has a pusher prop like this. Pushing prop is pushing like that. And on top, it has two rotors. So one rotor, above the other rotor. So we call this a, a coaxial configuration. And the thing is the rotor's turning in opposite directions, that cancels the torque effect. The pusher prop in the back is to make it go fast. So the Sikorsky helicopter right now has exceeded 250 knots, which is really, really fast for a helicopter. But what they can do with modern uh, digital computer technology is they can go do what's called feathering the blades. So in other words, all the lift is only produced on the advancing blade side. The retreating blade side is feathered, so it won't stall. Okay, so it just goes like that. And so all the blade is produced, all the lift is produced here, and over on this one, here. So that balances out my lift distribution, and now I can increase speed. But still, there's no free lunch. So I can go fast, but speed is, speed is still limited. So the last limiting factor is shockwave formation. So my rotor blade uh, at the blade tip is approaching speeds that are transonic, supersonic speeds, which means if they go fast enough, they will actually develop a shock wave. And uh, the problem with that is if a shock wave develops, it takes a lot, a lot of power to get it through the shock wave. That's why jet aircraft, when they uh, uh, exceed the speed of sound, they're actually pushing through a shock wave, and uh, many times they'll use an afterburner to do that because that gives them increased thrust and they get more power to go faster. So in a helicopter, I don't have that power. So that's going to be a limiting factor. So one thing you'll see on some helicopters, the H-60, the, uh, the Seahawk, that you see flying around North Island is this way. What they do is they have uh, swept wing tips. So in other words, the blade will go out like this, and then the blade tip will be like that. Then here's the fuselage down here, okay? So it has a swept uh, tip on it like that. It's not as big as that, that's out of proportion. But what that does is delay the shockwave formation. That's why jet aircraft have swept wings. that are going real fast, typically they'll have swept wings. And the reason they do that is to delay the shockwave formation. So helicopters can do the same thing. So their blade tips are, are approaching the speed of sound. They'll sweep them like that, and then they can go faster. And that will enable the overall helicopter to go faster also. OK, let's see. What else do I got? Oh, my goodness. I think I've talked about, every, uh, about everything that I can think of right here. Uh, any questions about, uh, say, how helicopters fly, how they're controlled? Anything about helicopters? I'm Mr. Helicopter Knowledge right here. So give me your question. Yes? How long did it take you to be able to do like 50 things at once? Like how long does it take to be just in your mind to do that? 
Okay, so how long does it take to do everything at once? Okay, when we go through, um, I went through flight school in Pensacola, and flight school was about one year long. The helicopter portion was six months of that. So by the time I ended the, the end of, so we start with fixed wing uh, training, and most people do that uh, when they're learning to fly anyway, because it's cheaper. So to, uh, to, get, to do fixed wing flight lessons maybe cost about a third of the cost that a helicopter flight lesson will cost. And that's because helicopters are more expensive to operate. Um, but by the time I reached the end of that six months of training with the helicopters, I, had, uh, uh, I was equivalent to a commercial pilot rating. So I understood how to do everything. But now they send me to a new and bigger helicopter at, uh, down in Imperial Beach, actually, when I went there. It's this new big helicopter that scares me, uh, senseless, and I go, oh my God, what am I gonna do? It's like going from, uh, going from your regular family car to a semi-truck, just like that, one to the other. Okay, drive, <laughs> oh my goodness. So you can imagine the feeling. But you, you learn to do, it's just like learning how to ride a bicycle or surf. Um, you learn the balancing routine and, and what all the controls do and by the time you reach the end of your training you're doing it instinctively but it does say it does take some work yes sir does the actual um, creation of, of the curve of the blade matter much I mean, uh, yes it does relative to the lift and drag and yeah it certainly does so they have they they have a whole range of, of blade designs like the, uh, the most of the blades that I started out with, like this one right here, is uh, a symmetrical blade. So it's the same on the top as it is on the bottom. And the reason they started doing that was because it's cheap to manufacture. Once you start putting uh, more curvature into one side or another, then your manufacturing costs go up. But you can also develop more, um, more advantageous uh, pressure distributions, which give you better lift for the same design as if it was symmetrical. If I do this, it's gonna be uh, more efficient lift-wise. One other follow-up, if you don't mind. Some of the helicopters that I've seen, um, they kind of uh, push the nose down and the butt up, right? So that they go forward Yeah. Um, in that swoop formation or, or angle formation. That's what they'll do. Actually, that will tilt up that way too. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, but, but the whole helicopter is kind of like swooping in that, in that direction. Yeah. So, the way that you were describing it, it's not the, the whole helicopter that, that tilts, it's only the, the blades or the, the top rotor, yeah. part, right? Yeah, typically the top rotor. Right. If so I did it very did gradually, right. the rest of the fuselage wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go. But it's like stepping on the gas. So if I'm stepping on the gas because I really want to accelerate, then I'm going to dump the nose over like that and pull collective. Okay. <laughs> and then that really tilts the, the, lift, the vector that way and gets me accelerated really fast, right. really quickly. Got it. And that's what you might see, especially if they're um, dumping on a fire or uh, something of that nature where they're trying to get in and out very quickly. Okay. You'll see, this, you'll see just the opposite when they come into land. So they'll honk the nose up real high like this, and that puts the rotor system way back like that, and it's like a big speed brake, it slows you, then you gotta dump your nose over like that and pull collective to land. Yes? Oh, I just saw on the tips of airline wings, to get rid of that shock, they put that angle up rather than back. Yeah, well, that doesn't get rid of the shock weight. That's good though. What, that, uh, some of the airliners, they have uh, the wing tips go up like that. So what happens on a wing is the air not only goes around the wing like this, but on the outside of the wing, it goes across the wing like that. So you have the efficiency of the wing is reduced by the airflow that goes around the edge like that. So to keep the airflow from doing that, they put, uh, they put a, a, a barrier up on the end. So now it can't go over like that. So that doesn't and so it, increase, it, in, it, incru, it improves the efficiency of the wing. And does that not come up or be helpful for a helicopter a rotor? Well, the, the problem is, at, um, keep in mind that an airliner might be traveling, say, at uh, 400 knots. Yeah. Okay? Out on my wing tip out here, I might be traveling close to 600 to 700 knots, approaching the speed of sound. And so that's extra... Um, extra uh, design uh, that has to be put into it, extra cost and engineering and everything like that. So, no, 
a, a lot of times you'll see what's called a burp blade. The Brits do this. So out on the end of the blade, they'll have a big round thing like oh, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's called a burp. And I forget what that means. It stands for something. <laughs> but what it does is it makes the blade quieter. Okay, it makes the whole thing quieter. Yeah. One of the things, you might have heard uh, the Huey, you know the Huey sound? H1 Huey. The H1 Huey, the Vietnam helicopter. Oh, yeah. You'll see them flying around. They're, they're still using them. They're still using them today in the Marine Corps. They've been around since 1955. But the design has been improved through all those years. So right now, uh, firefighting is using them. Um, if you see a firefighting helicopter, it might be an H1 series. But typically, if it's only two blades, you'll hear wop, 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 wop. Wop, 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 wop. <laughs> so it's making that wop, wop sound. And the reason it's making it is because the, uh, the blade coming up behind, so I got a blade going this way, it's making a pressure distribution. Like that, a big pressure wave. And then the blade behind it is hitting the pressure wave. Wop, wop. Every time it does that, at 250 times a minute. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, yeah. Any other, any other questions about my museum? I'm really proud of the museum. Yes, sir? I have a question about, say, Ukrainian helicopter pilots. Yeah. If they need to transition over to a Western design from a Russian design, like how big of a deal is that for the pilot? Uh, not much. Uh, uh, the, um, if they're flying a Western design helicopter, um, it, the rotor system might be turning in the opposite direction, which changes the whole torque thing. So all you got to do is get used to that. But if you're used to, uh, to flying a medium to large size helicopter, you can usually go from one model to another with a minimal amount of training. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I got one more. So the, the plates, you got, you got two of them, right? Uh -huh. So have, has anybody experimented with almost a, a circle, like a, an actual kind of, um, I don't know, like a, a disc? A disc, there you yes. go. Thanks. With, with whatever um, rotating uh, flaps or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. So now instead of you having the individual plates, you just got that disc that's rotating. Does that not work? That, not that was actually tried. The problem with a disc is um, now you're going to get uh, probably significant gyroscopic effects because I can't hinge the disc. So it's pretty much a solid configuration. So I can't hinge it to... Uh, to eliminate those gy gyroscopic moments that are transferred across the head. And the back prop or the back blade won't, won't be able to offset that enough. Well, it, the, it's not the, the back thing, the tail rotor in the back doesn't do anything for gyroscopic precession. Oh, it just works with torque. So gyroscopic precession is another problem. Okay. Okay? okay. That um, if you got what's called a, um, um, a uh, 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 fully articulated helicopter, in other words, the blades yeah. flap like this and everything, then that gyroscopic moment is eliminated. Even in some helicopters, have you seen the Red Bull helicopter fly? The Red Bull one? Red, it does aerobatics and all that. It's the only one that's allowed to do aerobatics in the United States. And they're out of Torrance, California. So I've talked to the pilot before, and they have what's called a rigid rotor. In other words, there's no, uh, there's no uh, hinging this way, like in a four-way articulated. So what happens though is the wings bend. So they, they can bend up and down like this. They'll bend a significant amount and that cancels uh, the gyroscopic mo uh, motions when they do that bending. Yes, sir? Was, uh, is it the Red Bull helicopter? Yeah, the Red Bull uh, helicopter. You said that they are one of the only helicopters that can do uh, kind of like acrobatic maneuvers? That's correct. Uh, can they do barrel rolls? Can they go upside down? Yes. They can do loops and rolls. And um, the problem with a, with a helicopter, say that one that's hinged, even one that's a rigid rotor, if I turn it upside down like that, the blades want to fold in the opposite direction. So what happens is he has to limit the amount of G's that he pulls. Um, you saw Top Gun, right? So they're pulling a lot of G's as they go through, you know, and it's pulling their faces down and all of that. Well, the helicopter rotor system does the same thing. There's G loading on it. So when he's doing his, his acrobatics, he's always making sure that there's positive G loading on the rotor system. 
so that it doesn't want to go in the opposite direction so and fold up like that. It down. Hmm? So it keeps it down. Uh, yeah, if you will. But when he's going inverted like this, the G loading is going in that direction. But if you do a loop, I got to pull a, a, at least a positive G's all the way through the loop. Otherwise, the rotors could uh, reverse and fold in the, the wrong direction. And then just a quick follow up question on that. Um, referencing Top Gun and kind of like the acrobatics that are involved in dogfights. Do the Red Bulls, uh, do they have any military use with respect to kind of like combat maneuvers? They do. Acrobatics? They do indeed. And both the Army and the Air Force have uh, combat maneuver uh, squadrons that teach that to their pilots so they can counter that. So nobody has asked me, what happens if the engine fails? Do I just fall out of the sky? Say abort, abort, abort. Abort, abort. <laughs> no, I don't say that. But I don't fall out of the sky. Instead, what I go in, into a thing called auto rotation. So auto rotation is how a windmill works. So these big windmills that are up there on the Laguna Ridge, they're working with what's called uh, auto rotation. The wind's going through them and turning it like a windmill. So when I when I'm flying the helicopter and it's powered. So the engines are working, it's powering the rotor system. The airflow, it goes from the top to the bottom, like that, as it goes through the rotor system, top to bottom. When, uh, if I were to lose an engine, what I do is lower the collective and the, and the nose, and the helicopter starts going down like this, but it changes the airflow direction. So now the airflow is going from the bottom up through the top. And the blades are turning in auto-rotation. So the blades actually rotate themselves. They're self-powered. So I can control the helicopter all the way down to an unpowered landing, say in a field or a road or something like that. Really? Yeah. So it's not like in the movies that you need to like parachute and leave? No, no parachutes in helicopters. <laughs> no, but in the movies, the, the tail, it, it, the ones that go bad, they just kind of spin around like and then crash. Well, right? the reason they might spin around is if they lose their tail rotor drive. So if you lose the tail rotor drive, you've taken away the anti-torque component. And so what might happen is it might start spinning around like that. Is that like the main okay, so you lose that when your engines go, don't you? No, no, no. So when, you're, when your engines go, um, the, the blades are in auto rotation. So actually, I don't have a torque problem because the blades are turning themselves. So there's no torque that's applied from the rotor blades to the fuselage because their blades are turning themselves. So here, uh, yes, sir. Would you rather be in a fixed wing aircraft or a helicopter if your engine dies? Oh, a helicopter. Oh, yeah. Because I know that I can land in that parking lot or that field or that baseball diamond down there. Whereas in a fixed wing, they're going to try and land on the 163 and they're going to hit by, get hit by a semi. <laughs> like that. As they come on the runway. That's why I tell my pilots over there in the simulator, I said, don't land on the freeway. If you land on the freeway, you're going to get hit by a car or a semi. It's going to run over you. <laughs> land on the access road on the side or pick a, uh, a baseball field or something like that to land in. Don't land on the freeway. Mr. L. Yes, sir. Hello. I mean, yes, ma'am. <laughs> huh. uh, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had like a, like has it failed or anything? I've had some failures, yes. But I've landed safely every time. And all of my failures, I've, I've actually been able to go back to, uh, uh, to a station and land. So a lot of helicopters that you see flying around now, uh, once they put jet engines back in the 50s and 60s, they could have two engines instead of one. So you got an extra engine. So that extra engine is to get the helicopter home mm -hmm. if one engine fails. <laughs> so now you get two engines, right? The H-53 that we talked about, the 40,000 pound max gross weight helicopter has three engines. And the new one coming out, you're gonna see a new one that's it looked the same, but it's actually bigger, has three engines also, but it develops over 11,000 horsepower. 11,000 horsepower, that's a lot of power. Yes, sir. No, no question, okay. So here's your, here's your, uh, here's your, oh, question, yes. No, what's your question? Okay, my question is, does it use uh, a gasoline for fuel? I mean, 
gasoline? Oh yeah, we use um, we use jet fuel. So if well, it depends on what kind of helicopter you're in. If you're in a piston-powered helicopter, you're going to use what's called avgas, which is basically um, um, it's not as volatile as regular car gasoline. So it's it's safer. Um, so they'll use that. Um, in a in a jet, we use um, or a, a turbine-powered helicopter, which has jet engines. We'll use uh, what's called uh, jet a, regular jet fuel, which is basically processed kerosene. Okay. So here's a question for you: What's the only aircraft that's flying on another planet? The only aircraft flying on another planet. I know you know. It's like <laughs> drone. Hmm? Helicopter. It's a helicopter. On Mars. Ingenuity, and it's flying on Mars. So we're kind of really proud of that fact. Is the only aircraft that's flying on another planet, sci-fi, is a helicopter. Okay, it's amazing. And they, they actually did a lot of research in order to get that helicopter to fly on Mars, which is a lot thinner atmosphere here than on Earth. Yes, sir? Are they developing electric helicopters? Oh, absolutely. Or yes, I should have mentioned that. So they're actually, the helicopter tech now is to the point where they're actually devout, developing electric powered helicopters. So they do have them. Again, the problem is uh, battery weight and, uh, and longevity on the battery. And hydrogen? Now hydrogen, I'm not sure. Like in a fuel cell? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I would have to research that. But definitely electric powered. But again, they're, they're usually short range right now, so they just don't have the, not only the battery, so a car battery, like you're driving, driving your Prius or something like that, that battery is really heavy. So you gotta get that weight up into the air. So you still have that 10 to one power to weight restriction for a helicopter. So the batteries have to be made uh, lighter and uh, more efficient. And no helium connection, like balloons, anymore? Actually, it's funny that you bring that up. So the question was, is there a helium connection, like with balloons? Yes, there is. In fact, um, the Navy actually, in the 1930s, the mid to late 1930s, the Navy had two dirigibles that were uh, filled with helium. So a dirigible has a rigid structure on it, right? But it's filled with helium. And they were aircraft carrier dirigibles. In other words, they carried their own airplanes. They each carried about five or six airplanes and they could launch them from inside the dirigible and recover them. Both of them uh, were destroyed in uh, strong wind storms on the, uh, one on the east coast, one on the west coast. So weather, is, weather will kill you every time. You don't mess with mother nature. So I try to stress that to my pilots at North Island. Don't mess with Mother Nature. She's going to win. Okay, you will not win, <laughs> guarantee. Um, but anyway, you brought up blimps. So blimps are actually coming back in. The um, they did. We do have a rotary wing blimp, uh, uh, a rotary wing blimp display at our museum. So back in the in the uh, 1980s, uh, a company built a rotary wing blimp. So it had um, a single shaft, the blimp, like a Goodyear blimp was around the outside, and then it had wings that rotated like this. And they were trying to design a mechanism that would pick up 100,000 pound logging loads. So they built a prototype that picked up a 5,000 pound load before they hit the B word. So all of these people that try and develop something, it's very, very expensive. Ah, a lot of times they end up going bankrupt because they just run out of funding and nobody will fund them. So anyway, but the Navy is talking about bringing back blimps now for a patrol aircraft. Now, that, will they be rotary wing? I don't know. But uh, they'll be blimped. They'll be filled with helium, not hydrogen. Okay? Good. Good questions. Well, thank you very much. That was fun. Awesome. Any other things? Yes, sir. Oh, one more question. Yes. Do you have music? Do I have music? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. So helicopters have radios, uh, so I can talk with people on the outside. I need to talk to the tower, but we also have a music radio, so I can tune up my latest uh, station. My, if I want country western, I want rock, I want the ball game, I can tune it up and then listen to it in the helicopter. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. I yeah. thought it was just solo you. And yeah, I never go out. Of, I never leave unless the music radio is working. Oh, 
Because you got to have some tunes, right? Yes. How can you hear it when it's so noisy? Do you have to your earphones? No, I got my helmet like this. Oh, there you go. So the helmet has uh, sound suppression. So in addition to being lightweight, so it'll protect my head bone, it also has a sound suppression in it. So I can hear. Yeah. But also, after flying helicopters for over 50 years, I do have high frequency hearing loss. Yeah. So my wife is often saying, don't you listen to me? <laughs> but honey, I thought you said this. No, I didn't say that. Yes, sir. No, I think he's raising his hand. <laughs> okay, he's a helicopter. So what you want to do, though, is come out and see our museum. You know, there's only, I'm, I'm going to put in a, a punch for the museum right now. There's only five dedicated helicopter museums in the entire world. Only five. And there's only two in the United States. A lot of museums will have helicopters, but only a very few are dedicated to helicopters only. So there's the American Helicopter Museum in Philadelphia. The Helicopter Museum in uh, Southwest England. There's a helicopter museum in Germany. And then there's the Russian Military Helicopter Museum, about two, three hundred uh, kilometers north of Moscow. And then there's us. Right in your own backyard. We actually own almost 70 helicopters. I have 40 on display, as well as uh, over 400 uh, related items in my museum, on display, all indoors. What right are the hours, sir? Yeah. So we're open uh, Tuesday, uh, Friday, and Saturday. Three days a week. Yeah. And we have a website. Website is rotors.org. Yeah. We're going on Saturday. So yeah. Oh, you are? Yeah, yeah in fact, this group we're going. This is the website. Uh, it's still for four more for the second That's six, the website. Six, six, Mr. Six, six. Oh, yeah. Which, incidentally, I helped them make. Yay. <laughs> Not that I'm any kind of computer wizard. Believe me, we were working with a computer wizard, but I just had the inputs to put stuff into it. But yeah, come on out. I'm working. I work there on Saturdays from uh, noon to six. Noon to six. Yeah. Uh -huh. We'll be there. Okay, good. We'll have a good time. I got a picnic area. You want to bring your lunch and eat it there? Got a picnic area there? You gonna do that? Let's give Chip a hand. Oh, yeah. Remember when I tell you that Mother Nature will win every time? He pushed the limits and he exceeded his uh, own limitations and flew the helicopter into the ground. The pilot did. Not going too fast or no, he just flew into bad weather. And he got he got what's called spatial disorientation. And so he, he didn't know exactly how the helicopter was oriented. I, I mean, obviously, everybody died, so they can't interview him. But I've been spatially disoriented before, and I know what happens when you get into weather like that. So you lose your, you lose your sense of how you're oriented, and you don't know what's what, and bam, you fly into the ground. Do you have radar and other sensors to check No. Out? No. It's all visual? Yes. He did have instrumentation. He could fly on instruments. However, he didn't have what's called a ground proximity warning system in it, which all passenger carrying helicopters of a certain size are supposed to have. And there, the company short-circuited the FAA rules so they wouldn't have to put that equipment because it's extra money that you've got to spend for that equipment to put in the helicopters. So by uh, configuring the helicopter, they short-circuited the FAA rule so they didn't have that ground proximity warning system in the helicopter. So not all helicopters have that in? No, no. It, it's a certain requirement for uh, passenger carrying helicopters of a certain size. So a lot of little, like the firefighting helicopters yeah. you see flying around, the sheriff's helicopter, uh, somebody, some student flying around in an R-22, a Robinson, they aren't going to have any, anything like that. If, if I might, I, I thought I saw a personal helicopter that's on sale, I forgot where. Um, you know, the, the small little one-seater with a little pull-up and a blade on it. Oh, okay. So what you saw was an auto-gyro. 
Uh, so probably a Benson gyrocopter. So you can buy kit helicopters and build your, but you can also buy uh, kit auto gyros. So uh, a company called, uh, gosh, I can't remember the, the parent company, but most people refer to it as a Benson auto gyro. So an auto gyro, uh, the blades uh, rotate like a windmill, like in auto rotation, like when a helicopter glides. So they got a pusher prop on the back and it's pushing them through the air and then the airflow is coming up through the blades the blades start turning and they lift the aircraft into the air. Okay. Yeah. How safe, in your opinion? Oh, know. those are supposed to be really safe. Now, I have never flown one before. I don't have an auto gyro rating. That's a separate rating you got to get with the FAA. Uh, I don't have one of those. But uh, the thing is, you're always in auto rotation. So there's no engine to fail. Huh. Well, if, that, if there is an engine to fail, I should, it's because you got to push your prop sure. in the back. But if that fails, I'm already in auto rotation, so I'll just find a place to land. But I can land in a very short distance. So an auto gyro could land in a, a distance of about from here to the wall. The, the big difference is an auto gyro can't hover. A helicopter can hover, uh, an auto gyro can't hover. Okay. Yeah. Ah.